everyone. Welcome to another edition of Coffee Break. My name is Steve Barrett. I'm the Editorial Director of PR Week, and I'm delighted to be joined by PJ Pereira today, who is the founder and uh, creative chairman at Pereira Odell. And uh, we're going to be talking about brand films and all things creativity. So welcome to Coffee Break, PJ. How are you doing? Very good. Good to be here, Steve. Yeah, so we're talking um, soon after the Brand Film Awards were uh, handed out this year, the sixth year of the awards. You were our inaugural chair back in, uh, back in ooh, it must have been 2016 now. So you've seen the sequence of, of the Brand Film Awards and you've been involved in brand filmmaking for a long time. You got a couple of on, honorable mentions this time for your Corona and Bella Artois films. Where do you think brand filmmaking is at as a genre, as a craft, uh, based on your practice, but also seeing the films in, in the Brand Film Awards this year? I think that the, the biggest uh, development is actually come from the sheer volume of work that is being produced. I mean, the, the fact that, uh, that uh, the more more marketers and agencies realize that we are running out of time to to buy in front of consumers because they're shifting towards uh, more on demand forms of, of entertainment and, and, and information consumption. Uh, we need to brands need to, to to get in front of them and create content that they will want to play themselves. And I think that this is getting becoming more and more of a clear notion for everyone. And it, it went from becoming that experiment to be ready for a future to becoming a reality of today and a, and a race to, to, to have your skills and have your process ready and in place and operating before uh, this is, is no longer a negotiation we're having with the world. So I think that the volume and the amount of work that's being produced is creating a way more competitive space and the quality uh, of the best work that is being produced immediately um, rise, can raise, get raised as well. Were there any films that stood out for you in the awards this year, apart from your own, of course, which we'll, we'll chat about? Yeah, I, I love the, the, the simplicity of the, the, the Shot on iPhone series as, as a whole, because not only they are beautiful, they are beautiful pieces of, of craftsmanship, but they're but they also have a very simple premise that that even before, and I think this is an important part of of, of branded entertainment and branded content, branded films, you know, how whatever you want to call it, is that they have a simple premise that you get even before you you watch the whole thing. So you like the idea, you get the message before you watch it, and then you go watch to see if it really pays off, and it's wonderful. And all the entire series is a great example. Yeah, that was terrific. That was our brand film of the year this year. And it was kind of one of the things we've always discussed is where the, where the brand fits into the film, if you like. Some of the early films, I think it's fair to say, was kind of long ads, weren't they? And and the way the brand was inserted into the narrative was quite clunky. And the filmmakers felt, or, the, or, or, or at least the brand felt, they had to sort of plonk the brand in the middle of the film, which isn't really the right way to do it. Whereas with Apple, the iPhone is obviously character really in the film because all of these films were shot on an iPhone but it, it was done seamlessly and just made the point without having to hit you over the head with it. You could claim that oh, that's cheating because they almost cheating because they are they have the camera itself but it's not because they 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 changed the way cinematography works because of that so actually the the the, the product and the brand becomes a character in the film in a certain way because it's it's a different eye for for cinematographers in general, so you can you can actually understand what's going on there, or how the product is changing the way that that film is being told, and and I think that that's a mark of a great brand film is that when the brand is clearly there from the premise to the execution, without annoying the audience of like oh okay oh that just got reminded just woke up from the dream from the story to see no it's there and you don't you don't care you're you're okay with it. The truth is. People, the world enjoys advertising. They don't care about brands. They just don't like bad stories. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, the viewer doesn't think of it as a brand film, do they? They think of it as a way to spend their time and to be entertained. And I guess that's the secret of a great piece of content. You've got such a, a small amount of time to grab someone's attention and you've got to, really got to draw them in. Otherwise, they're gone, aren't they? That's the nature of content consumption these days. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think of, of, of art in history, 
art has always been sponsored by someone with money. There's always the art needs money to to grow to get to spectacular levels. It happens that that for a while there were the rich families, and then they became they kind of those funders became the studios, and then maybe now it's the streamers and the brands. It doesn't matter. People know that there's some money behind it, and the money may have some some kind of of um, intention of be, behind the, that that funding that process. But it's uh, if it's all done in the clear in the uh, in the open and and the, the the reasons are honestly put on the table. It's it's totally fair. Yeah, I always like to cite the Michelin guides as a good example of that. I mean, they started in 1895, I think, and that was brilliant branded content, wasn't it? But, it, you know, it was genuinely useful. Um, another film I liked when, when I interviewed Jimmy Chin as part of the show, the Brand Film Awards show, and he's a mountaineer photographer filmmaker, but doing a film around the Ford, uh, the, the Bronco. But again, the, the Bronco is part of the is a character in the film because it's it's taking him into places where he can climb mountains and the other characters in in that series of films and it, it just fits in seamlessly tell us a bit about the, t the two films you got honorable mentions for the corona and stella two beer brands how did you approach those two projects and uh, what was what was the brief and 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 how did it how did it come out it's it's interesting because they are both for the same client that is enhouser bush and bev but they are completely different situations. One is Corona was a global project uh, that is the whole for the whole world except for the U.S. because they 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 operate the Corona brand globally. And Stella was for the the U.S. Uh, parts of of Stella. The, what they do have in common beyond being for a, uh, an ABI uh, beer is that they were both produced in the middle of the pandemic, which created a massive hurdle for for both situations one was a summer campaign for a beer they're mostly consumed in in bars and restaurants and and all of a sudden bars and restaurants were closed and what do we do so we we and, and we were had to promote this idea of these living these beautiful gorgeous life the life artoir that that stella promotes and for like but but we are all stuck at home and and for like you know maybe we're gonna need to inspire people to to Think about living in a different way. That's where the daydream. We, we remember the 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 loving spoonful song, and we we did a music video about the celebrates daydreaming and, and imagining all that. So while we're here, we're just gonna you're not gonna get stuck, and we're going to, not gonna allow ourselves to get stuck. So that was one way of doing it. The other one was a project that we had for Corona. Was a project that we had ready to go. We were ready to start shooting. Uh, and and we're going to go around the world and and record the lives of people, the pioneers that decided to live close to nature, when COVID happened. And all of a sudden, like, how can we go to to ten different countries, to so eight different countries, and shoot people living their living those lives? It's very weird and and complicated. And we we had to navigate through a lot of that. And we finally found a way to record and kind of as as the 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 remote location. Recording got better. We we found it. We cast it. We went there and, sh and shot the whole thing, which allowed us to made us realize that something much bigger was going on here. That that as as we were working on production, we were also witnessing the world move away from big cities to closer to nature anyway. So that process of that that we had already noticed that the inside that we were working from to to make this story work that people wanted to live closer to nature because they were feeling boxed in their their like homes and offices and everything it actually accelerated people started to move closer to nature because they wanted to live that life anyway and when we got when we finally launched it it wasn't by design it was it was based on an insight but the between realizing the insight and launching it Things got much bigger, and and it became way more more important. And now we are working on on new seasons of of that idea. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, the the idea kind of came to the the world, didn't it? And it was dovetailed nicely. Were there any complications around Corona as a brand? Obviously, with coronavirus, that at the start of the pandemic, uh, there seemed to be some chat around. Uh, the brand, but that that seemed to go away. Was that a factor at all, or was that just just something you pretty much ignored? 
In the beginning, we were talking, we discussed, and I think that the, the, the brain stayed quiet for a while just to understand what was going on. But the, the, the reality is that there was nothing they could do. It's their name, and, and there was a coincidence there. In, in, and I think after a few months, the, 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 the beer brand and the name of the virus started to get more decoupled, and COVID-19 became more of, a, of, a, of, of the, 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 the proper name of, of the virus, and, and it, got, it got much better. What were the biggest challenges in producing a film when most people are in lockdown? And were there any things that came out of it that you think, yeah, this, this worked really well. We might continue doing it like this when we come back to whatever the new reality is. I think that the, the, the first challenge that was a smaller one, to be honest, was not being able to, to be in places and, and not be able to, to, to fly and be there. That we were, but then the technology was ready, was available in the industry found a way to, to, to manage itself. So now I, it's honestly right now I'm, I'm okay with like 90% of the shots uh, of the shoots. If I have to, if I can do it from home, I'll do it. Cause then I can go to more than, than I was going before. I think that the, the real challenge that, that happened after we, 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 we skipped that, that hurdle was the, the fact that everything started to look very similar. Everything has started to have that Zoom kind of look or a single um, environment. And you could have like, I think the world developed this COVID look and feel for stories and breaking away from it when every location, every city had a lot of restrictions was, was difficult. So when you're shooting uh, daydreams, for example, we could only have a certain number of people in the in, in a specific place. So we had to to take the talent and it was a dance act. So we had to have dancers and everything. So we had to get dancers in a van, drive them to the location. Whoever wasn't on that shot would just have to leave. And sometimes people would just go prepare the entire set and then get in the van and get out. The other the other van came came and prepared the whole thing. So it's it was um a a logistics challenge during the 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 shoots but but we were doing that because we wanted to break away from the real challenge that is not looking like everything else. Yeah, that's, uh, it was challenging, but people came through and they were creative, weren't they? And I take your point about everything starting to look the same. So that, that's, a, that's a good point. Just to finish, um, you relocated, relocated to the New York area a couple of years ago from California, from San Francisco. How have you settled into the East Coast and you are, are you a true New Yorker now? funny because I, I when I moved from I used to live in in San Rafael in the Bay Area that is like 45 minutes commute to the city so because I wanted to be a little bit more close to nature have a backyard for my for my family and everything so when I moved I I looked for something similar I kind of what is like 45 minutes to one hour commute and I I found a place in Greenwich Connecticut and it was fine I moved and, and found a house and everything started to live here and then by the time that I, I like a few, it took me a few months to actually find, to know that I could go from my house to the office without taking the wrong train or without taking the wrong subway. And, or if something changed in the subway, I could still find my way around it. When I finally got that and I told some people in the office, I think I got this. Now I can get here with, without kind of getting, fr without being afraid of, of any somewhere else. Then the next week, COVID happened, and, and I've been stuck at home for for a year. So I I I, I right now would say that I'm more in the Connecticut life than the New York life. So I'm not a New Yorker yet, but I'm 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 definitely loving the East Coast life. Yeah, you're gonna have to relearn it and get get the City Mapper app uh, going as well. So how how quickly do you think people? Are people desperate to get back in the office? I think people want to go back and convene again, but we were speaking earlier about the commuting part. I think that the, the commute and the, the office life actually is, is going to come back. People, are especially younger people that live by themselves, they're alone in their, their apartments. They, they want to have these, um, these life again, kind of see people again, interact again, and, and I appreciate it. We are, you know, we are preparing our, our offices to, to get back together. I think that life is going to be different. It's going to be a new a new style. Uh, for us, it's, it's a hybrid. We're allowing people to work from home or work from the office or a combination of both. And I think most people that we know are, um, are going to be 
some days in the office and some not. Some people are not going to show up whatsoever. Some people are going to live far from the, the cities, which is a good thing. I think we are allowing, we are going to allow people to have multiple, to, to coexist. People that would choose different lifestyles are going to be able to coexist instead of having to be forced into a, sim a simple, uh, specific lifestyle. I think that the, the biggest, right now, I, I would say that the challenge is, is public transportation. They're okay with working from home or working from the office or hybrid or whatever, but public transportation seems to be freaking people out. And and I think that eventually they're gonna come, they're gonna get over that and, and, and it's gonna, things are gonna go back to a different kind of normal and hopefully a better kind of normal. Cause I think that I heard a, a friend of mine told me uh, a couple couple weeks ago that life as we, used to know it seemed architected by extroverts that feed on social interaction and all of a sudden when we got stuck at home all the introverts rejoiced like oh my god life can be actually so interesting we with the protection of the screens and the cameras and and there's a certain level of anxiety among the introverts that they're going to have to be forced back into the, this life that they didn't even realize that they they didn't like so i i hope that this is an opportunity for us to to reshape life in a way that both sides and other sides can actually be not only comfortable but appreciate the the choices that the other ones will make without resenting them that people that are going to the office every day don't resent people that are not going people that are not going to the office don't feel like oh they they are being excluded from certain certain opportunities um uh, when compared to people that are every day in the office i take like Andrew and myself, my my partner Andrew and myself, we are very have very different personalities. He's in San Francisco. I, I hear in, I'm here in the East Coast. He likes to go to the office because it feeds on that energy with people. I I actually enjoy that that little cocoon that we have, and I'm gonna go to the office less often. I hope still I still go, but I'm not gonna be there every day, and and I'm gonna take advantage of this to to be able to be in both offices and and work with our international clients, and that kind of helps me a lot. But it's I I I'm enjoying it. I'm starting to get finally get rid of the 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 guilt uh, that that process um, gives us and and creates for us. And and I think that this is going to be a good thing for for uh, for the workforce in general. The flexibility, as long as we as a society uh, learn to to respect each other's choices without without resenting them, without punishing them from being different from us. Yeah, that's that's a great point because uh, it is going to be different the hybrid workforce and the hi hybrid workplace. But uh, you're right, no one wants to cram on a subway or a train for sure. But uh, anyway, PJ, thanks for joining us. Great to chat to you on Coffee Break, and uh, looking forward to meeting up in person sometime soon. Mm -hmm.